Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson, and I'm joined by Terry Robinson. Today, we're going to bring you another episode of Tomes of Magic. And uh, I am excited for this one. I had a big fire in my backyard last night to get ready. You might even call it a large fire. So I am pumped for today's episode, definitely. But, uh, You're full of quintessence. I, I am full of it, uh, full of something today, certainly. But anyways, uh, before we get into it, uh, I just wanted to give a moment to announcements. And I actually had one myself today. A couple episodes back, we did Dragons of the East for revised edition of Mage the Ascension. And I recommended a couple of books to for a storyteller planning a game in East Asia to sort of you know get into the mood, pull a few ideas out. And one of the books I recommended was uh, The Classics of Mountains and Seas, a, a very old uh, Chinese book that was uh, translated by Ann Burrell. And past week, I finally had a chance to sit down and read it cover to cover and really uh, uh, think about it. And, you know, it is a pretty cryptic, um, and to be honest, rather repetitive book. So uh, if uh, storytellers are getting ready for a game in East Asia and they don't read it through, I totally understand. I put together some notes to sort of hit the high points and and mention uh, why a person might want to read it. And so I put that online. I'm going to put that link in the show notes, sort of the cliff notes for that book. I can understand if you don't have time to get to it. Well, today in Tones of Magic, we are covering the Mage 20 rulebook. It came out in 2015. Satiros Brucato was the developer, along with Bill Bridges. Brucato is the author of the primary text, and although parts were written by three other authors, additional material was contributed by six other authors. Uh, Terry, can you give us a walkthrough? No. <laughs> oh, that, well, all right. I mean, considering it's 668 it, pages, it, I, I, guess, I guess I can see why a person would not prepare a walkthrough for that. I was going to call you a slacker, but uh, not today. <laughs> <laughs> so... But for fans who are interested, friend of the show, Chaz Kellner, and I did a read-through of M20 from the point of view of someone who is not already highly familiar with Mage. I don't know when we'll finish. I don't know where it'll go out. I don't know if it will ever exist. But if it does, we will announce it here. And that is a chapter-by-chapter walkthrough. In that, we are four and a half hours in, and we're at about page 375. So if you're like... But I want detailed coverage on a page-by-page basis of M20. Don't worry, Mage fan, it may exist at some point. (laughs) Depending on how much paradox you accrue. Exactly, exactly. It's an extended (laughs) ritual. I don't know if we'll make it to the end without botching. So... (laughs) Well, Mage 20 is a huge book. I have a large file with all the notes I took while reading. I selected some highlights for this episode. There are several things I'd like to discuss in more detail, but I'm trying to keep it brief today. Before we get into the book, I want to set the scene. In 2015, the landscape for tabletop RPGs had changed. The stores where customers could buy RPG books in person and see the new releases were much fewer. Not only that, but most stores that carried RPG products drastically reduced their shelf space. The large game stores in central Texas mostly stocked D&D 5th edition and, if you're lucky, one or two other top-selling games. Most RPGs are advertised and sold online now. Mage 20 is part of the World of Darkness 20th Anniversary series. Terry and I call it X20 for short. The X20 games took a new approach. Thicker books, slower release schedules, and they were targeted primarily at people who were already World of Darkness fans. I wish I copied down the URL, but I read an official statement from an Onyx Path employee stating the format of uh, X20 books. The plan was to make rule books around 550 pages that had the core rule book, the player's guide, and the storyteller's handbook in one book. The thought was most World of Darkness fans bought those three books anyway, so putting them together was convenient. That, together with the notion that these were marketed towards people who were already World of Darkness fans, made the thick books far less intimidating. So why have I been joking about how Mage 20 is such a thick book? Well, I'm comparing it to other X20 books. Werewolf 20 is 524 pages, Vampire 20 is 508 pages, Wraith 20 is 490 pages, Vampire Dark Ages 20 is 457 pages, Mage 20 is 668 pages, and that's not counting the backer information and indices at the end. Not only that, but Vampire 20, with its overflow book, is a total of 587 pages. Mage 20, with its overflow book, is a total of 967 pages. I looked it up online, and 967 pages for a rulebook and its companion qualifies as a lot. Terry, your thoughts before we get into the details? 
Yeah, it, there were some interesting shifts in the business model that had occurred. There had been a, a movement in how books were being priced and distributed throughout the period from the early 2000s and there more in detail. But my feeling overall with the M20 lines is they were a celebration. They were a love letter to the fans, which is interesting because we had just gotten off of the revised convention books that said these books are love letters to the fans. Um so there was a bunch of things that they had to do. The first three books, the first three lines, Werewolf, Mage, and Vampire, did not generally update the meta plot outside of certain small things. But that was departed with lightly for Wraith and Changeling, where there were some pretty big changes uh, to the core setting. So even that X20 process across the different game lines was a learning process. And if anything, I feel as if the X20 games were a victim of their own success. I think they did better than a lot of people anticipated. And and when they became people's first entry into the world of darkness, a lot of the books weren't very well suited for that. So I think we as a community still have a question of, so how do we get people up to speed quickly? When we did our talk about the quick start, uh, a bunch of listeners reached out and said, hey, I was planning on using the quick start and assuming that was enough. And as Adam and I discussed, it can kind of get you there but there are some inconsistencies between that and the core book. It doesn't quite give you all the information, and we will hopefully do an episode at some point about the, the best way to get up to speed on Mage as quickly as possible. And I feel a lot of the X-20 books, as I said, were kind of victims of their own success. They sold well, and they ultimately became a lot of people's entries into the world of darkness, and not all of them were well-suited for that. It's, it's what got me back into Mage. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, our first section is what's new and noteworthy in the rules. Affinity Sphere, called Specialty Sphere in previous editions, opened up in Mage 20, and Affinity Sphere is one sphere the player spends less experience points to raise. When Mage started in 1993, it was assumed that each tradition had a way of looking at magic that favored one sphere, so that sphere was easier for their members to advance. Mage 20 opens it up for most factions and allows the player to choose their Affinity Sphere. It speaks of a sphere that a mage has a personal connection to because of their awakening or, or something else. The trouble is each faction has a list of affinity spheres to choose from, so the relationship between personal experience and faction culture gets fuzzy for me. I will say, though, that this inspired me to expand the affinity sphere for factions to more than one. Giving players a choice sounds like a good idea. Significant amounts of quintessence can be gained from, quote, large fires, end quote, killing animals and killing people or at least using the remains of the recently deceased. So uh, this will really affect your games. Firewood is an easier source of quintessence than nodes, so why worry about nodes anymore? The developers didn't want mages to fight over nodes like nations fight over oil, but this is not the right way to accomplish that. Also, things can turn macabre quickly as player, players start killing birds for quintessence. In Mage 20, how do you quickly find out if there are other mages nearby? Go to your local hardware store. Are they out of lighter fluid and bird seed? There are mages in your neighborhood, so watch out. Skills had a number of changes. I really liked how a number of skills were simplified by the well-skilled craftsman rule. Instead of things like stone lore being a skill, just make it a specialty of esoterica. Starting with first edition, there has been a list of secondary skills that storytellers need to decide if they will use or not. Uh, now fold them into specialties. Great idea. However, there is a list of secondary skills in this Mage 20 book that aren't secondary skills. Uh, they are the skills that don't fit on the character sheet. The large number of skills in this game is not my thing. I would cut down the skills list for my games. When Guide to the Technocracy added lots of skills, I thought that was to balance out the perks technocrat characters got. Now it looks like that's the game design philosophy. There are rules for limiting magic the players can do by requiring they have a skill rating that matches the sphere level they're using. This makes mages less powerful until they spend a lot of experience points. That rule is listed as optional, but I noticed in the later chapters of the book, this book assumes you're using the optional rules. Should they really be called optional then? When I see optional rules in an RPG book, I want the authors to tell me how my game will work if I use it and how my game will work if I don't use it. Sanctums are more expensive now and their benefits have been reduced. Apparently the developers thought sanctums were too powerful. I handled that problem by making my players afraid of exposing their hideout. The Do martial arts skill is one unique martial art again, as it was in the uh, 
original uh, two editions of the game, and it's handled better than it was in Revised Edition. The martial arts skill is the same as Brawl, only better here in Mage 20. In 2nd Edition, it was a more expensive skill. In Mage 20, no player is going to choose Brawl. The martial arts skill here allows lethal damage pretty quickly. With a slow healing for lethal damage, your games could get out of hand quickly. Nerfing the martial arts skill may be a good idea. I think there are just too many backgrounds. I would combine several of them for simplicity. Uh, hanging effects are in Mage 20, but if you blink, you'll miss them. I think a section should have been here calling attention to hanging effects and delayed trigger effects. Uh, sphere magic has been weakened by calling for more spheres uh, to make effects and rotes possible. Uh, players will have to purchase more dots and spheres to accomplish the same things they may be used to doing from previous editions. Terry, what did you find new and notable in rules? Just kind of a preface for this, M20 is a big book. I walked in with about 25 pages of documented changes and so on. We are not going to go through them in the entirety. If we miss something, apologies again, it, it's a chonker. Uh, comparing rules across editions is, is quite difficult. There were a few times when I thought there was a new rule, but then I went back to revised and reread it. And I'm like, oh, okay. If you read it this way, there is no disagreement. Like for instance, I didn't realize in revised until the book Ascension that there was a plus one difficulty for per two ongoing effects, which I eventually found in the core rule book tucked away outside of the magic systems chapter. Mage books of this scale hadn't really previously been done. As a project gets harder, it is harder to keep the internal pieces together. So we, we expect some kind of difficulties because when you're writing 500,000 words, the person who wrote the first word and the person who wrote the last word may not be the same person. M20 is the edition I use at my table. So this is my, my working copy. I don't do a lot of modifications. I get rid of rules. I really don't add some. So if at any point it sounds like I'm talking about something that doesn't exist yet, I may have accidentally projected forward to what I already know from Book of Secrets or how do you do that without realizing it. And finally, one of the rules I have when interpreting Mage is I don't believe what the authors say outside of the rules. What do I mean by that? Rules are generally written in technical language. They're usually unambiguous, or at least they attempt to be. Things about setting and mood also in often include metaphorical, figurative, or poetic language. So it is a little bit harder to interpret setting changes unless they've been repeated multiple times, or the author is using language that is highly definitive. Like for instance, if, if an author says the Nefandi are a knife in the side of the tradition, what do we take from that? Two different readers can can consider that in different ways. So I am generally very slow to realize setting changes unless they are definitive, pointed out, and reiterated. My understanding generally slowly converges on what the authors do, but I think that is less likely for me to take a random line or paragraph or something and run like that, which is something I encounter a lot when I'm looking at other fans' interpretations of the setting. And with that, we have some changes to the character sheet. As Adam said, Dodge is no longer on there, and now we have Esoterica in addition to Occult. While Occult represents the knowledge of supernatural societies and the understandings of the supernatural world, as a mortal or the masses may understand it, Esoterica is much more specific. I get the impression that this split was created because this book renews the mechanism of Arite being informed by attribute plus ability, or a Rite informing attribute plus ability. And if you roll that all into a cult, a cult essentially becomes a power stat or something that you are highly rewarded for having. So by making that esoterica, it makes it so that those roles are less reliant on a single trait and you need to spread out your advancement a little bit more, or at least that is my understanding in the same way that on the technocracy side, you have hyperscience and that way you just don't have uh, intelligence plus science making every Rite role simpler. Combat no longer uses serpentine initiative. The person with the highest initiative initiative says what they're doing and it happens as opposed to, okay, everyone roll, declare what you're doing in opposite order. Person with highest to retake gets to choose what they're doing last to represent their ability to pick. We now have brawls and martial arts, as Adam said, this was to represent different styles of combat that in no way doesn't mean that people are still arguing over it. The idea is that martial arts includes kind of a, uh, a mystical element to it that we may not necessarily associate with it, which uh, creates an interesting tie to presume that martial arts are fundamentally mystical or beyond regular mortal ken, which is a choice. Yep, bonfires, man. 
get out there, fuel the world. It's kind of nuts. I can understand the justification. And to me, for that to be reasonable, we would also need to do the opposite where we say, hey, it requires a large amount of quintessence to create fires. And I don't think we get that in the core rule book. I think that's something that we don't get until how do you do that? As Adam said, secondary skills are not optional. They're just talked about throughout the book as if they are. No other X20 system does that. Werewolf makes a reference to career skills and hobby skills. That's about it. The spheres in general have been reworked. More actions now require a bit more sphere to do stuff. For instance, grabbing things at a distance is in one place indicated to be correspondence to, but in another place it indicates that you need matter to to grab a non-living thing or life to to grab a living thing, which has historically not been a requirement. Backgrounds have been reworked extensively. I don't know what blessing does. It takes a page and we just kind of get the generic idea that it can periodically help you with a thing. Legend, on the other hand, is kind of interesting. It is a new thing that generates quintessence from you being a thing. If you look like, like Chuck Norris, you can now get quintessence from people going, wow, you're Chuck Norris. Uh, and you can give people a pair of Chuck Norris action genes and that counts as uh, TAS. Domain, D-E-M-E-S-N-E, -E -E, represents a dream palace and we get a lot of description of it, but not really any uses. Retainers and allies are now redundant as allies says within it, that it can also represent retainers. So I agree with Adam that a bunch of these uh, could have been collapsed. Healing is now harder. You can dodge explosives with any sphere except mind. Uh, splitting successes is now optional again. It kind of defaults to the presumption that large effects just need a lot of successes and you don't need to do a tedious breakdown, which you may or may not like. We get a bunch of new systems. Quiet gets a kind of high level overview in terms of how it occurs and how it can be bled off. The idea seems to be that a sufficiently large backlash can push a, push a mage into quiet. And as they deal with the manifestations of quiet, they spend willpower and they can bleed off paradox, which gradually reduces their quiet. The system isn't quite fully baked and there are other ways of entering quiet such as through tra trauma or mind attack and there's really no mechanisms on how to deal with those because it doesn't have a paradox pull backing it and in this case the quiet is generated as an alternative to the paradox being blown off so it seems like you have to generate the secondary quiet paradox pool and then you you track that but it's a start and I, I certainly appreciate that. Resonance and synergy are now in here. Previously, we had resonance, which reflected kind of the metaphysical uh, fingerprint of the mage. Here, resonance now kind of reflects what you've done and follows you around. This is like a tiny manifestation of paradox and it kind of has this like karmic or weird W-Y-R-D angle to it and effects may reinforce it or go against it and affect difficulty. Synergy, on the other hand, is the energy given off by an area and that too can affect difficulties. This suggests that raising the dead at a graveyard is appropriate and that may reduce the difficulty. This seems in a lot of cases kind of redundant with our normal axis of coincidence and so on, but it seems to be an additional layer on top of those. And also resonance and synergy no longer need to be aligned with the metaphysical trinity. In revised, if you got a resonance trait, it would be dynamic, entropic, or static. And here that's, it's kind of opened up a bit more. We now have structure and durability, which is indication of how hard it is to break something. This makes it generally very hard to break stuff, which may make sense. You don't want your characters being able to drive a truck through a bank vault. The tricky part here is it is explained two or three different ways throughout the book. In one case, it's called soak. In another one, it's indicated as adding threshold requirements. In another case, it's kind of indicated as just being additional health requirements. Uh, we get genetic flaws, which is kind of another type of flaw that is tied to cybernetics and other technocratic enhancements or technomagical enhancements. And uh, they tend to be a little bit less concrete. They often don't have systems necessarily to them and are more flavor-based and are considered to be the downside of permanent technocratic adjustments and so on. So they're kind of interesting, but not a lot there. And splitting dice pools is now done by simply dividing your smallest dice pool among whatever actions you want to take, as opposed to taking dice pool penalties. This is one of the cases where a character from revised going into M20 may notice severe differences. If you were highly specialized in something, you could easily split your dice pool two or three ways in revised and be an absolute disaster when it came to like discharging a, f a pistol or what have you. Here you might have a third the dice at your disposal. Certainly simplifies things. There were a lot of other rule changes where difficulties were increased by one or decreased by one. I don't feel a need to go through those, but these were the ones that kind of stood out to me. And the next thing we're going to talk about are what happened to the factions? Adam, what happened to the factions?
Factions are up next. Uh, many of the traditions have new names. The text states, if you want to keep your setting the same as the 90s, you can use the old names, but the new names reflect changes for the 21st century. I don't think that's a fair call. The authors want to change, uh, wanted to change names, but the IP owner in Europe didn't. Uh, the awkward compromise is the result. The traditions, both names for the traditions are used throughout the book. Longtime mage fans can work this out, but new fans will be confused by the multiple names used throughout the book for the same traditions. The Celestial Chorus now shuns orthodoxies. That sounds nice at first, but orthodoxies define religions. If you belong to an established religion but throw out the rules, you're kind of creating your own religion. Friction with other people in your religion will follow, but maybe that's the point? I, I'm, yeah. I'm not the right one to comment on that. CAX, or C-A-C-S, is new for the technocracy. The computational anomaly correction specialists don't belong to any convention, but they are uh, under technocratic leadership. They keep an eye on computer and network activity. Revised edition made the progenitors the nicest guys you ever met. Mage 20 questions this, making the members of this convention more odd and off-putting. I, I like the change. The VPO, if that's a... Uh, Vice President of Operations or something. I could be wrong on that. But the VPO leadership of the syndicate uh, was changed to make them appear more sinister. Uh, the Hollow Ones became team players and organizers now. There's no mention of dissent or losing members because of this new direction. Uh, this clashes with previous depictions of them. The Taftani are more peaceful and cooperative now. This makes sense to me. But what I didn't like was two times it mentions they're Muslims now. I thought their connection to pre-Islamic Middle Eastern culture was one of the things that made them so cool. Uh, the mention of technocrats being absorbed by the machine at Erite 10 makes me suspect people new to Mage may avoid playing technocrat characters when they learn about that. Uh, Terry, what did you notice for the factions? For the factions, we get a third representation of what control is. We get that they are, it is the manifestation of the will of the old masters, that they direct the honor eye, which is a new group of kind of uh, emissaries. I'm not quite sure what to call them, and hopefully we get more information on that later. The traditions now get a list of what they stand for. And they talk about things like excellence, diversity, and respect. And before we didn't really get that. And that is kind of necessary to set a contrast with the technocracy in a world where both are intended on being player factions. I can say Society of Ether now. I can just say it. I don't have to be like Sons of Ether, now known as the Society of Ether. And I'm really happy about that. Anyway, so thank you for that. Um, progenitors have shifted over time. I, I will certainly agree with that. They have they have gone from both ends to the creepy as heck to uh, goody two-shoes end of the spectrum. And I, I, I like the s slightly, um, yeah, we're not sure how we feel about what we're doing either. The hollowers seem to play well with everyone now, which seems to be a bit of a change. And they, they kind of went from being a combination of romantics, postmoderns, and gutter punks to being mostly seemingly postmodern, which is fine. I did like those other two factions and I hope that they pop up somewhere. Yeah, the, the Tif Taftani Islamic connection felt real weird. And I get this from the fact that they repeatedly refer to Allah. And it may be the case that, that is, they are simply using the Arabic word for God in the same way that a Arabic speaking Christian would refer to God, to the best of my knowledge, as Allah. But that also implies that they are monotheistic. And in Lost Paths, it specifically said, why would you limit yourself to one God? Get a six pack of them. Um, like crack open the divinity, Taftani. And that was interesting. Their move to Dubai and escaping the empty quarter. I'm, I'm very curious to see how their tendency to depend on areas that don't have a lot of people in them to do their flashy magic will come out. And again, hopefully we eventually get more information. Um, I got the distinct feeling that the traditions are no longer assumed to be the default in other books. Uh, throughout the book, when an example was being given, it would no longer say like a chorister does this. It would say a dower priest does this. And I like that shift because that's how I try and frame things. It is useful to think of the traditions as stereotypes to get going. But once you do a little bit more reading, you realize how big each of the traditions traditions are and how those stereotypes can really start to fail. So talking about worldview and so on, the marauders have been broken into those with internal and external quiet. The ones with external quiet are similar to the ones we discussed about in Revised, where they have a reality bubble, where the ones with an internal quiet don't have obvious external manifestations of quiet until you interact with them. We get a list of groups that could join the disparates, and this includes a bunch of groups, and all of them are fascinating, and I hope we get more more information about that. Uh, the Thunder Society, the Balamob, the Red or dedicants that it's a ot yes <laughs> the the nefandi are are no longer 
uh, three groups. They are no longer the worshippers of the outer dark, the worshippers of the undead, and the worshippers of the astral. Uh, we now have five or more. The the worshipping the cult of the star squid, as I call any of the entities that really def- reflected their focus outward, seems to be minimized. And now they're more just kind of a symbol of human depravity. I miss the cult of the star squid, but I, I think it's a perfectly legitimate choice for an addition to make. As Adam mentioned, Arite 10, technocrat. You just merge with the spirit of the machine. You win like ascension done and i'm like oh okay that's the first time that's ever been listed to the best of my knowledge adam what changed in the setting well now we turn to what we noticed in the setting of mage the disparate alliance is new most of the crafts banded together but they're keeping it quiet for now this alliance is uh, predicated on their belief that the technocracy is under the influence of the nefandi the nefandi are a bigger threat in mage 20 now, the book encourages us to say they infiltrated and now pull the strings of the technocracy and or the traditions the authors seem to like the crafts more than the traditions now the disparate alliance gets more positive press in this book than the traditions although i expect the traditions will remain fan favorites well, springs are new unless I miss them in revised edition. When a significant event among sleepers occurs, it may generate quintessence that mages can harvest. The beliefs of the sleepers or the emotions involved might make the quintessence more appropriate for certain mages. Uh, you could think of them as temporary nodes. This is a nice solution to prevent mages fighting over nodes, but I would have liked to see more systems for them as well as a more detailed treatment. The book tells us numerous times storytellers can make their own call on whether the Avatar Storm is still present, but the default Mage 20 setting has the Avatar Storm gone after running for more than 10 years. The High Umbra contains realms again. The River of Language has moved back out uh, of the Vulgate. I'm okay with that. We learn the Adamites of the Technocracy, those who frown on clones and other constructs, go trolling at constructs by eating apples in front of clones. Can you imagine being that much of a bastard? Although, doesn't everybody eat apples in public? I mean, I didn't realize it was rude. Should I eat pears instead? Uh, Seriously, this kind of trolling wouldn't work because apples are a common food. (laughs) Terry, what did you notice in the Mage 20 setting? As far as the setting goes, we get a much more extend, expanded timeline. The timeline section it, over a large number of pages very much plums the history of Mage, but it does it kind of at a weird pace and scale. It frequently makes mentions to groups and people that will never come up again and that you don't quite have enough to run with them. The comparison I'll make is that when we were talking about Revise, the timeline made frequent references to Tezgul the Insane. And we never really find out who that is. We get one reference to be like, yeah, he was an Infernalist and he took over like Estonia or something like that. If you want to run with it, I think you just need a little bit more. Like the, the list of names is sometimes useful, but after a while it was just it was just kind of a flood of stuff. The the book says that the the Ascension War is anyone's game and opens with a mention that that there is hope and technology isn't all bad. This kind of is a tempting to me to feel like it's starting out on a more hopeful mage setting, but it still tries to depict a world on the precipice. I I think it was boring that they kind of doubled down as the technocracy being the foe, especially to the, the disparate alliance in a lot of cases. One author, I don't remember where this is suggested, is the idea that the technocracy is the foe because they believe that they have been infiltrated by the Nefandi, and that is the angle that they are going on. The traditions are just blowing up fronts and so on, where the disparate alliance is kind of doing this this subtler game to deal with the possible nephonic infiltration. The Umbra has kind of been reset to how it is in 2E. The Afterworlds are now in the High Umbra. They were put in the Low Umbra in Revised. Spirits have shifting appearance again, as opposed to the much more set ex- appearance that they had in Revised. And the spirits are listed as having shifted appearance, but then you go to the spirit section and it just gives one description of what every spirit looks like. The spirits, again, have a vague hierarchy. The book generally doesn't use the mage terms for the spirit hierarchy. It uses is the werewolf term, so it makes references to gafflings and jagglings and so on, and we get a bunch of like kind of conflicting uh, hierarchies. It dispensed with the Bolt and Mikado left-handed, right-handed thing, which I am I am fine with. That was kind of an interesting idea that basically said in one path you had the idea that there is this structure that all spirits are kind of jockeying for position in the courts, but at the same time, they have something kind of tied to their nature, which determines their uh, their power level and their abilities, and that they kind of move back and forth between the two. We never really got any information outside of the in-world letters from Book of Madness, and that was, at least for me, kind of hard to follow. The digital web chapter, we get extensive rules on it. I didn't think it needed to be here necessarily, but given that it was, it's actually a 
pretty concise coverage of it. You can get by without necessarily needing Digital Web 2.0. It lists the Digital Web as being a godlike meta being. Awesome. Tell me what that means. <laughs> Just give me any, any description. There's a bunch of other cosmological shifts. As Adam mentioned, the River of Language is now considered to be a, a realm within the Vulgate. We don't get any information on the spires. It now appears to be the case that to reach the epiphanies, you need to be astrally projecting again. Again, it just mostly took the cosmology of Tui and brought it back. If you liked what was an infinite tapestry, you'll need to do a little bit of work to, uh, to make that work. The Null Zone and the Paths of the Wick are now kind of suggested to be the same, but at least the rules do go through and say, hey, we have presented an inconsistent cosmology here because cosmology is weird. In one case, the outer bowl may be a zone, meaning it is something that cuts across layers of the umbra and can be entered and exited anywhere, possibly. And in other cases, it is a realm. It is part of the middle umbra that one can find and then pick it up from there. And I'm, I'm actually okay with this because they said it. They said, hey, we are presenting this in multiple versions. They make mention that Mount Kof and the digital web may not necessarily be the same thing, so on and so forth. That's okay by me. So that goes over kind of what has changed in the setting. We get a few other bits that the New Horizon Council is now instantiated that it was originally a ruse to, to suss out the technocracy. And then they're like, well, this kind of works. So let's, let's run with it, which is interesting because it kind of recognizes the Avatar Storm having happened and so on. And I think it's located in New Zealand in the Southern Alps or something like that. So I hope eventually we get more information on that. Not necessarily a full-blown Horizon Stronghold of Hope, but a little bit, a little bit more information. But uh, beneath all of these changes, there were kind of some changes changes in, in concept and how mage is. Adam, what did you find new in terms of concepts? Yeah, the concepts uh, uh, topic is, is one that uh, interests me, certainly. What we used to call foci are now called instruments. Uh, focus now means beliefs plus practice plus instruments. When we were talking about the uh, Mage 20 Quick Start, we mentioned this some. Uh, I think this is a, a big demand of new players. I like to ease them into things like paradigms. Uh, Mage 20's approach to paradigm is uh, new and not new at the same time. Uh, Paradigm had little explanation in the first two editions of Mage. I remember online Mage groups in the mid and late 90s where Mage fans often took a view of Paradigm that I called the kitchen sink approach. They saw Paradigm as being how magic worked, a Mage's ethics and morals, goals, style, a favorite flavor of ice cream, everything. I was less active in online Mage groups in the 2000s, but it looks like the trend may have continued. Mage 20 authors listened uh, to the fans and brought this understanding of Paradigm to the game. I don't favor it myself, but if it makes a lot of people happy, it's hard to complain about it. To help sort things out, they have a list of paradigms in Chapter 10. Players aren't required to choose from this list, but it's encouraged. Later, Mage 20 books are also using it. I think choosing your paradigm from a list is, it, it just does not work for me on, on a very basic level. I can't do it. There's a new approach for outgrowing instruments. Instead of doing an effect instantly, mages now need to keep within their beliefs and practices. I would have appreciated examples and systems for this, at, le at least something. It just would have, would have helped me. It was mentioned uh, earlier in the book. I just totally didn't understand it. It was mentioned again later in the book, and I finally put the pieces together. But yeah, some, some examples would have just worked wonders for this. I think I understand what they're talking about, but it's going to be tough for some people. I will say, though, that it has made me rethink my approach to increasing Arate. Uh, the first two editions had mages using one sphere with no instrument instantly at Arate 2. That now feels like too early to dispense with Paradigm. I thank the authors for helping me question my approach to the game. One problem, though, is letting go of instruments. Seven instruments map to nine spheres, and I don't quite know how to do that. I've talked with several other mage fans running Mage 20 who have the same complaint. They go back to previous editions for outgrowing instruments. This book states truth and reality in the world of mage are subjective. Not only do I not know how to portray this setting to my players, but I think it takes a lot of subtlety from previous editions and throws it out. Exploring the gray areas between objective and subjective truth has led to fun games and rewarding discussions for years. I don't want to see that lost. Page 79 defines the word reality in Mage for what I believe is the first time. I've said in the past that the power to change reality doesn't mean anything unless you define what reality means in that sense. It is now defined as a person's perceptions. I disagree with this definition on multiple levels. I'm not going to use it in my games. A firm link is established between normal human insanity... Uh, the quiet that mages experience, and becoming a marauder. 
Uh, many mage fans have assumed this for years. I didn't myself, but um, there are different approaches to the game. I see quiet marauders as being different than normal human insanity. It certainly makes it appear strange that Doisetep tolerated Porthos as quiet for so many years, but Porthos is no longer with us in Mage 20, so perhaps that isn't a problem. Synergy is new in Mage 20, and I love it. This is a great idea. Synergy is when a place or event has its own resonance. This can make the magic of some mages easier or more difficult. It can also interact with a mage's personal resonance. More examples and systems would have been nice, but I can run with this without help, so I'm happy. Uh, Terry, what did you notice in concepts? As far as concepts, and you'll notice that some things that Adam lists as a rule, I have a concept, or I have something as a concept, Adam considers it setting, it, it all, we all get it out there. Overall, the feeling of the game, and this, again, this is going to be harder with rules, it's easy for me to say, Revise said this, and M20 says this. So these are all things that people can certainly argue with me over. The game felt like it wanted me to focus on the mage as an actor and their will changing the world. This kind of stemmed from a definition of magic of doing something to enact change. That is a definition of will that fits with the theme of power, autonomy, and consequence of mage, but at the same time, to me, it kind of narrows what a mage can be. This felt very Crowleyan, and I think it gets rid of a lot of notions of magic that could be defined by, for instance, religious practice, where the mage does not consider themselves to be even necessarily a tool of divine will, where they are merely letting divinity out into the world, for instance, or doing things long established as part of a practice. And as Adam mentions, what does it mean to drop an instrument if I believe in a technocratic or scientific paradigm and I don't need it anymore, but my paradigm fundamentally says that the universe is well-ordered and that certain things are required to do certain things, what does it even mean to drop an instrument? Because at that point, I'm dropping my paradigm as well. In Revise, there was an idea that mages kind of converged at the top, that as you shed instruments and you shed focuses, you kind of understood the nature of the cosmos in this kind of general way. But here, since you're never dropping paradigm, since everything is done through the lens of paradigm, I don't quite know what that means. And again, Adam mentioned the, the sphere mapping not quite working out because you have seven instruments. In some places it says, hey, drop your least used instrument because that's the one that would you would least need. And another one that says you would drop your most used instrument. And I'm like, okay, what does that then mean? Because if you're doing that at a lower retail and you're dropping it immediately, you don't have enough play experience to know uh, what things are. As Adam mentioned, reality is defined as as what human perceptions show. I find it interesting that we finally have a definition of reality. We don't have a definition of arete. Arete is variously defined as force of belief, understanding of the cosmos, the degree to which you can see through the illusions of reality. Uh, these, to me, are not mutually intelligible. It very much comes across that arete no longer represents wisdom, but is kind of the magic strength trait, which is fine. But it really gets rid of the idea of, to me, mages becoming more refined and in tune with the universe because they are just becoming more in tune with a paradigm. It's actually, to me, a stat that represents how doctrinaire your character is, not how kind of open and understanding they are. Again, that's something which is pretty easy to change at the table, but it, it is something that, that kind of stuck out to me. I think it may be just the fact that it, we brought back the K and it talks about the Crowleyan notion of will in a lot of cases and that brings some baggage with it. I perfectly see the understanding that, yeah, this is, a, this is a game about your ability to exert will in reality, but to me that brings some implications with it that I don't always like. Again, the game in a few places talks about it being satirical, even though in M20 it really doesn't feel satirical. Sometimes it does feel as if it's satirizing things about our world, like uh, the stuff where you have like Benning Aerospace, for instance, and so on. And it didn't really land because there's a specific note in here that says mages don't realize that they are all doing the same thing, where part of the key satire of the setting is mages realizing that they're all doing the same thing, but not willing to mention it. Uh, I think that is an uneasy tension. I think Mage is at its best when it is earnest, and that's one of the, the things I really liked about, about Revised, although sometimes it took itself a little maybe too seriously. How Paradigm is presented to me falls kind of flat. We get the notion of paradigms that they are more worldviews of your character and not necessarily a magical worldview of your character. Like to me, the fundamental thing the paradigm does is it explains what is in the nature of the cosmos that allows you to do magic. And a bunch of those paradigms don't answer that question to me. So when it says like, everything is chaos, I'm like, okay, yeah, the universe doesn't make sense. It's great. Where does magic come from? Part of it is the fact that the paradigms were very, very 
big buckets. It also makes mention that rotes and instruments and so on can't be shared across paradigm. But to me, there is a lot of cases where you will have different paradigms, but similar instruments and practices, and you should be able to fair pair. It is really hard to tell the difference between a mechanistic cosmos and a divine order to all things. You can just kind of view one through the, the lens of the other. If you believe that there was a creator that set everything in motion, that is both a mechanistic cosmos and a divine order to things, in my opinion. There's a lot of rules for modifying the difficulty of effects to get the result you want. And this is something I only realized because this was my third time reading this book. For instance, it mentions you can work without a focus in some cases if you increase the difficulty by three and spend a point of willpower, which is only mentioned in one places of the three places the rules are brought up. I'm not bitter. And in another place, it says if you spend an extra turn on an effect, you can drop the difficulty by one to a maximum of negative three, which means that if you have... 30 seconds <laughs> based on a turn being three to 10 seconds, you can work without it, which is, again, this is me kind of reading the rules to min max, but it is one of those things where if you really want an effect to go through, take time, take advantage of synergy, do a little work to make it blend in with your local environment, use tools when you don't need to, and you can make some pretty big effects pretty straightforward, where on the other end of the spectrum, if a storyteller really doesn't want you pulling off flashy vulgar stuff in the middle of combat, it is perfectly reasonable to say, well, the reality zone is going against you. You are fast casting this. It doesn't match with the synergy of the place. So in some cases, this may just lead to arguments. In other cases, it will really let you dial in the difficulty of magic to make the magic that is happening in your game seem more thematically appropriate. We also get the most expansive recommendations on determining if something is coincidental or vulgar that have ever been in Mage. And it gives kind of a couple of different sets. One, it talks about the question of, is the universe the thing watching you or are other people the thing watching you? Which is interesting and that is a legitimate axis of concern. But in addition to that, it says, hey, here's a whole bunch of internal considerations that the question of vulgarity not only comes from observers, but from what the Mage themselves believes is appropriate. And there's a two thirds of a page sidebar that kind of discusses that, that I thought was interesting and somewhat new. I think one of the powerful things that many of the authors bring to the pages is not necessarily giving you defined systems, but here are six or seven things you should consider when talking this through and negotiating this with your players. And I, I think a lot of the writing is at its best when that's where it's focused. We get a much more detailed discussion of reality zones than we ever had before, that we kind of get the idea that underlying reality, there are kind of baseline assumptions. And Revised mentioned this, that there are laws to the universe, that there are certain things that are generally always going to be vulgar. We then get three variants of this, the high-tech zone, the primal or mystical zone, and then the localized bubbles that may have their own reality. I very much appreciated this, but I wanted a little bit more meat on dem mechanical bones. And it is interesting because it talks about how it will modify the difficulty and not just through it being vulgar or or coincidental. So we now have an additional layer of difficulty modification that can adjust something up or down. Another kind of soft factor is in the section that talks about the, the storytellers. It really reinforces the idea that the storyteller is the person who should be driving the game as opposed to it being the actions of the table. That's not a, quite a consequence, but it's one of those things where when this came out in 20, what, 2015 or 2017, uh, that kind of view of things to me had already become passe by at least a decade. And it still kind of has that this is the grand story of the storyteller and the players play it and they provide random input as you tell your grand tale, which is not something I think Mage does necessarily very well. And I had a lot of things to say about concepts. Um, Adam, overall, what did you think? Were there any uh, favorite bits? Is there anything else that didn't fit neatly into categories or... Well, let's see. Yeah, I, I did want to uh, say before moving on that uh, Terry and I uh, traded notes as we were getting ready for this, and I saw Terry's uh, mention of how Paradigm is defined in Mage 20, but Arete, not so well. And I was like, oh, yes, abs absolutely. I totally agree with this, but I don't have a lot to add to it, so I'll, yeah. I'll let Terry up to bat for this one. But yeah, that was a point very well made. Um, I just wanted to talk for a moment about how new fans versus old fans are going to see this, and then we can roll into our general thoughts on the book. Uh, this is the first core book that has technocrat player options on an equal footing with other options. That's fine, but n what's not fine is the explosion of game terms that causes. The text becomes hard to read because of so many alternate terms in the same sentence. It's very hard for first-time mage fans to take it in. Uh, I learned the game terms and concepts before I took in the alternate technocracy terms, so I feel like I had an advantage there. 
Uh, that, together with the book's sheer size, is going to make new fans think twice about taking this on. I realize the 20th anniversary series was designed with existing World of Darkness fans in mind, but what I see is Mage fans wanting to introduce others to Mage, and this book does not make that easy. In recent years, I've heard people saying Mage is hard, you know, a hard game to learn, to really understand, and also to run for players. And after reading this book, I think I understand where a lot of uh, these comments are coming from. The skills, the many spheres involved in rotes, the structural damage rules, countless game terms. Uh, this is the book that makes me agree, Mage may be a hard game, especially for in the point of view of, of new people coming in. Another thing I've noticed recently is a lot of Mage fans saying they want to build their own rule set for the game. I used to think it would be a lot easier to pick an edition and run with that. Now, after seeing some great rule ideas in Mage 20 and some other rules that I don't think are so great. I totally understand why people are constructing their own rule sets. I'd like to do it now, too. Anything to add before we get into uh, general thoughts, Terry? As you mentioned, it's a case where the fans, us players, have been given a lot, and it's sometimes hard to pick. And coming up with that ultimate set has made it interesting in that you can really dial in the game you want, but I feel that comes at the cost of making it a little bit harder to talk about the game. Uh, Adam's Table uses a different set of rules that are all listed in it, like, oh, we use this optional rule, we don't. And that, to me, can really make the game diverge. I can't complain that more people are playing more varied games, but it, to me it has the side effect of making discussions about Mage a little bit more difficult. Is it a floor wax? Is it a dessert topping? It's both. So what did you think about it overall? Color images and new artists gave the book a different look than what came before. The chapter start images and faction template images were quite good. But most of the art in the book was, I gotta say, rather dull and bland for me, other than those two top two categories I mentioned. Uh, previous editions had more action scenes and thought-provoking imagery. Uh, also, the color images kept pulling my eye away from the text. I think black and white illustrations are best for RPG books. One thing I, I gotta mention, though, the template image for the New World Order was absolutely absolute genius. The man holding the small mirror in front of his face on page 189 to reflect light away so that he's, it's harder to look at him. This is an iconic image of the New World Order. I think it was a mistake to depart from this in Technocracy Reloaded. The magic chapter had shorter sections for each of the nine spheres with players encouraged to choose effects from a list I can see why they did this, but what I found is the longer sphere sections uh, we saw before encouraged people to think more about how to build their own effects. I'm glad I got that introduction to sphere thinking. Uh, with skill requirements, more spheres needed for effects and other adjustments, the power level for player characters is lower than second edition, but higher than revised edition. I would not run Mage 20 rules as written. I advise people to house rule this game to avoid problems with quintessence gathering and excessively detailed rules. Uh, using a book this thick of the gaming table, I don't think is practical. My advice is get the PDF and make your own storyteller screen, a character gen book, and a rules book. A drive through RPG and Amazon both sell empty Game Master screens with sleeves for standard printer paper on both sides. So you can have a total of eight sheets displayed, four to the players and four to you. Making a custom storyteller screen is simple. Uh, FedEx Kinko's is the place uh, I go to print out different books that I'm going to put together for my games. So I would print out my own character gen booklet, and another one for rules, and then you put it on the desk uh, and you ask them to spiral bind it. It's cheap. The book will lay open to any page if, when you set it down on the table. Uh, so it's very easy when you're juggling a couple of different materials at the gaming table. In the process of preparing your two booklets, so you can adjust the rules the way you need. After reading this book, I really think it's just too long. There's so much filler, opinion, and humor that bulks up the book. Uh, one example is the Systems chapter has a section on rules for the digital web. It starts with a page and a half of one person's views on the real world internet. There's so much stuff like this that should have been cut. Uh, this project needed an editor with the power to say no. The chapter on character generation would be much easier to reference if the humor was cut out. As for this presentation of the game, I don't like the fact that everything is defined and interpreted for us in the world of Mage. The earlier editions hinted at fascinating possibilities and that, uh, then let us play with those ideas. We could reach our own conclusions, but not in Mage 20. There are so many warnings not to do certain things and explanations of what everything means. It's, it's like the whole game is on rails. Finally, there is a negative view of the early editions of the games. Uh, of the game, I mean. Uh, two examples are worth noting. Page 376 says, quote, as opposed to the science is evil tone of Mage first edition, end quote. But science wasn't evil in first edition. 
The virtual adepts and sons of Ether were in the traditions. They were, they were good guys. The technocracy wasn't evil because it used science. It was evil because of how it was trying to influence society to view science. On page 533, we have, quote, Mage First's magic rules are broken. Please ignore them. Thanks, end quote. I know they aren't broken because I ran multiple games with them. This sidebar in Mage 20 claims the first edition rulebook uses a correspondence three example with a mage calling a taxi. It doesn't. They're referring to page 165 of the first edition rulebook. That page has no mention of any spheres. It says mages make their own luck. That sounds like entropy sphere to me. This uh, swipe at first edition has nothing behind it. Not many people are running first edition games these days. If the authors don't like it, they can just not mention it. Uh, those are general thoughts I wanted to mention. Um, what were your general thoughts, Terry? Overall, I, I was glad to see that there are some there are some real heavy hitters in the art department. Some of them are new iconic images that are now my standard for when I think about the group. The uh, the syndicate art of the person just kind of drinking with the cloud of ravens around them. I, I've always felt that there was a slight semi mysticism to the syndicate, and I really thought that captured it. As you mentioned, the NWL art is is great. So the the one piece that I need to call out as being like is uh, the the Society of Ether art. It is a steampunk character, and it kind of I want more like the the one e two e picture of the ray gun gothic retro future gal in the space uniform while you have the tiny TV headed ape carrying a dish that is just so more etherite to me than somebody in in steampunk with a uh, with a high collared coat on, but. Eh, you can't win them all. Everyone in the book is thin. Everyone is thin, sexy, and attractive, and no one over the age of 35 seemingly exists. This is a criticism I have of RPG art. Mage in no way corners it. My solution to this to get someone who weighed, like, that had a BMI above 18 in a book was to back a Kickstarter at the you get to be an art model level. Just in comparison, to know that how RPG art tends to mutate, a, uh, a friend of the show was commissioning a piece of art for a book they were writing, and the the notion of slimming things down is so thorough that he had requested that a piece of art depict a van being flipped and the van was turned into a sedan. So not even cars are immune to the fact that artists tend to thin everything down in RPG art books. So yeah. Uh, as Adam mentioned, this book kind of takes swipes at previous editions and it'll use phrases like contrary to what bloody blah said. I'm like, this is a different edition. You don't get to talk that way. You go, you don't get to tell another edition it was wrong. That's that's like me being like, yeah, you're uh, or Adam. I've been reading your diary, and I think you're wrong about that. What, what are you doing? Get out of my house. <laughs> um, th this book picks up after Tales of Magic Dark Adventure. It talks about one of these excesses, which I get. And it says, like, contrary to revised, it's it's like, okay, you didn't like the system, you get to change it, it's a new edition. And the thing that bothers me about that is if you're going to take a, a swipe like that to me, at least point out all the changes, at least have an asterisk or something that says this is a change from a previous edition for those of us who are looking through and just trying to find the new stuff. If you're going to do it in some cases, make it a feature. <laughs> the voice is rambly and in some places condescending. I get the sense that the author had a lot of comments about what's happened since they last were able to write and wanted to get it all in. Uh, for instance, the author litters references to media, but not in a useful way. For instance, you can describe something and then say, oh, it's also like this media that someone may be familiar with. So for instance, if a section says, uh, to use the example Adam brought up, Manipulating time is doable, but it may come with complications that mages may not anticipate. Futures may fall apart. Worlds may unravel, just like in the movie Donnie Darko. Say, for instance, that is a case where you are using a media reference to add flavor to something in few words. Where if a mate now, this book tends to do things of the style, changing time can have complications. See the movie Donnie Darko for more. You're like, wait, okay, what? What complications? Tell me. And a lot of the media references were like that, that if you hadn't consumed that other piece of media, it would just fall flat and you still didn't know what the author was talking about. Sections simply have more words. Like for instance, a lot of the rule sections are identical to revised in terms of what they contain, but for whatever reason, Mage 20 just takes twice as many words to get there. The systems are somehow fluffier without really much additional description. The crunchy bits like spheres are kind of riddled with inconsistencies. One that's stuck out for me is, so I'm a rules person and I'm a number fan. So it said that Astral Sojourn is the only way to go beyond certain areas. And then on the next page, it said, Mine 5 can take you to the Deep Umbra, where Deep Umbra was specifically listed on the previous page, page as a place that only you could access with Astral Sojourn. The spheres are generally 
less useful at a given level. You have to have more dots of more things to do stuff. And a lot of those things will become inconsistent even further once how do you do that comes out. It may be the it may be possible that I am just not reading it in such a way that I can see when the additional spheres are required in which they aren't. But I'd like to think I'm familiar enough with Mage that if I'm not understanding the difference, a lot of readers probably won't. On the plus side, this has probably one of the best storytelling and advice sections that we get in any of the core books. It really does a lot to try and build the world with theme and mood and so on. And I think the the authors of the book are at their less, best when they say, here are some ideas, here are some guidelines, and go from there. It seems like they had very strong opinions of what a game of mage should look like and how it should play, and would just kind of yell at you not to do certain things. And I think mage players are perfectly comfortable kind of going outside of that. This feels like it was a lot of the rules were added in response to harried storytellers talking to the authors, talking about the terrible things their players had done to break their game. And that kind of resulted in, oh, you have to do this and you have to have four dots in medicine before you're able to do this. And you have to do this other thing. That'll that'll show them where uh, to me, RPG design has advanced since then. And this book generally doesn't recognize it. Generally, that is a problem across Old World of Darkness. Mage has no play mechanics. Everything is a character mechanic. There, there are no mechanics that are fundamentally uh, narrative. They are almost all in-world and character-facing. And that's kind of one of the things the book has to deal with. Overall, it's got a lot of good stuff. It, you have to go through a lot of things to, to do it. Adam had recommendations on how to create your player guide. The, the tricky part is all of those things require the storyteller having already read everything. And I don't know about you, Adam, but it took me about 30 hours to get through this from soup to nuts, including notes and cross references. That's, that's a lot of time. That's not quite a work week. And that was including me doing things like skipping the section on spirits because I just didn't need 15 write-ups. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it took me longer than you. I, I had to sit down and really read and, and check stuff from previous editions. Am I nuts or is this? Oh no, here yeah. it is. So yeah, <laughs> it, it was quite a process. I took extensive notes because I, I don't think I'm going to have the time to read this book again. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a hard position to put a storyteller in. It is fun as a leisurely read. Normally I read books on the treadmill so I can kind of multitask, which is why sometimes my episode reviews come in kind of spicy because I'm like, ah, this book was not very interesting and my legs hurt. But I took the time to uh, to sit down with a deluxe edition of this and read through it. And in a lot of cases, it actually, it was quite pleasurable. Uh, the book makes a lot of references to other books in previous editions, which makes it even harder to, to work its way through. I hope the community can come up with a way to help onboard storytellers quickly, because I don't think this book does a great job of it. Maybe we come up with a hatchet list that says, read this chapter, this chapter, this chapter. Um, if Adam and I get time, we may try and do that. No promises, but we'll try. As always, it is a hard introduction to Mage. There's a lot in here. Some of it's glorious. I like some of the reworkings. The new focus system is 70% of its way towards something really good. The wheels just kind of fell off for me in a bunch of places. This is a mage book beyond the scale of what I believe a lot of the people had worked on before. And some of those cracks showed. Someone to kind of knit everything together to make sure internal consistency was there would have been good. But again, it's a nearly a 700 page book. Doing that is, is really hard. But my note to the reader is if you find something that sticks out as you, that seems kind of weird, that seems kind of inconsistent, it might be. So don't don't feel bad if you're like, hey, this, this doesn't seem to, to fully hang together. This is a core rule book. It is the first in a new edition. It tries to do everything. It does a lot. It makes some curious choices as to what is included and what is not. And I, uh, I look forward to going on from here. Definitely. Well, did uh, I, I don't have any story ideas for this. That would be taken on a bit much. But uh, any good quotes uh, were, were found here? I, I'd like to hear. So the single paragraph in this book that has raised the most curiosity in our Discord and has had the most people pop their heads in and say, yo, this is the Mage of the Podcast Discord. Did we ever get any more information on blah blah Is the list of organizations that could join the Disparate Alliance. So the Disparate Alliance, the loose allegiance of independent crafts that have taken the Ascension War into their own hands independently of all the other players and so on. And one of the ones that is introduced is the It's Ot and... One of my favorite sentences in the entire book, the It's Ot, a long hidden sect of Mayan time seers who mysteriously escaped notice for over 500 years. And I'm like, if that's not mage, 
I don't know what is. Part of this is a shout out to friends of the show, James Sombrano, who was involved in the M20 writing process, but none of his sections ultimately made it to the end. And this was the only one that made it in. And I just wanted to say, James, love your work. I wanted to shout out and hopefully one day we get our It's a Ot craft book. We'll, we'll see if that happens. So that was that was my, my quote. Okay, well, with that, I think we're... Uh... Ready to lead out. Um, I just wanted to uh, give a thank you to executive producers uh, who uh, helped make these episodes possible. I wanted to name Oracle, Buck Farmer, Oracle, Christopher Phillips, Oracle, Jay Widner, Oracle, Michael, Alex, uh, Anders S, Andrew Edelstein, Anon, Berto, Bo, Boogers, 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 Boogers. Brad of the Blue, Bryce Perry, Chris B., uh, Daniel Scribner, Dan Svensson, Dennis Osborne, Derek Semsick, Elliot Osborne, Garga Lenoir, George Lara, Guy Conan Stewart, Ia Bull, Isabel Castillo, Jason Kennedy, Jason Vines, uh, Jason W. Briggs, uh, Jeff Byrne, Jenna F., John Magnuson, Josh H., Josh Heath, Carl Haleperin, uh, Leslie Weatherstone, Matthew Prohl, Michael Credle, Michael Parker, Morgan Aaron, Nibiro, Neil Patterson and Nikita Klamanov, Oliver Schindler, Patrick Mulder, Puka G, Rail Scheinhammer, Cardo, Richard Bat Brewster, Robot the Robot, uh, Rob H, uh, Ryan Hilton, Ryan Kennedy, Samuel Tobin, uh, Stephen Carton, Thrice Great, William Connolly, William Martin, W Starter, and Zach Rolls. If you have something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com with your questions, comments, or feedback. Subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other aggregators. If you like the show, others might like it too. And if you leave a review for us, then it makes it that much more visible in other people's searches, and we would certainly appreciate it. You can follow us on Twitter at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there and see the complete show notes. What are we reading next, Adam? Next up is How Do You Do That? Which is uh, one of those uh, times when you have a book title that is a complete sentence. Kind of like back when they had margarine and they said, I can't believe it's not butter. Isn't that a little long? No, no. It's cool. People like it. I have a copy of it in Spanish and I love the title because it's available in Leatherette and it's Como Haces Eso? Um, and I just thought that was that was fun. Well, that's it for me. Thanks, everyone, for listening. As we covered the Mage 20 rule book, as, as we lead out, I just wanted to say truth until paradox, baby. Go change reality. Bye.